Our Father, we thank you very much for your goodness. Thank you for your people. Thank you for your servants here. From all over Africa and outside Africa. Thank you for our ministers and bishops and pastors and Christian leaders that have joined us from other denominations too. We are praying, Lord, that the growth that we have seen in deeper life will see it in their churches as well in Jesus' name. That together we'll hold hands together and we will move on and do your work in Jesus' name. Bless your servants, your people, here meeting together this morning. And we pray, Lord, we'll never be the same again in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. Let's all be seated briefly at this time. We're speaking on the subject of a pattern for visionary leadership. The pattern for visionary leadership. This concept, visionary leadership, contains two important words. One word, vision. The other word, leader. A Christian leader is someone who is called by God to lead. Just as the hand of the Lord is upon you, my brother, and the hand of the Lord is upon you, my sister, and he has pulled you out of the generality of membership of the church, I mean church at large, the body of Christ, and he has put his mantle upon you, and he has put the commission in your hand, in your heart, and he has said, go and lead some part of my people. A leader then is the one that is leading with and through Christ-like character. You demonstrate as a leader the functional competencies that permit you to have effective leadership to take place. When we talk about vision, vision is a clear mental portrait of a preferable future. That is, it's still in the future. And it's a desirable fi uh, future. It's a preferable future. And vision is that clear mental portrait in your mind of that desirable, preferable future communicated by God to his chosen servant, called to lead his people. And as you read Proverbs chapter 29 verse 18, you will understand if there is no vision, there is no progress. If there is no vision, there is no movement towards the desirable, preferable future. It tells us in Proverbs chapter 29, in verse 18. Proverbs 29, verse 18. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. As we come to one man in the Bible, in the New Testament, he stands out very clearly as a visionary leader. And it doesn't matter who is reading the account of this man. He may be an evangelical. He may be a Pentecostal. He may be a charismatic. He may just be a Bible lover. He might not even know the Lord too deeply. If he reads the account of this man, everyone will come to the conclusion that this man was a visionary leader. He had vision. He carried out the vision. I want to tell you that even as you look at his life, he had vision even before he became born again. Only that the source of the vision and the direction that the vision was leading him was so very different. As I look at Paul the Apostle, I see a visionary leader. But as I see this visionary leader, I divide the vision of his life to four categories of four parts. And it's wonderful. It's a joyful scene that at last he came to the last part or the last level of the vision which actually mattered. As you look at Paul, you'll see number one, self-induced vision. Then you are going to go to the second stage of his life before he met the Lord. And you are going to see the Sanhedrin-influenced vision. 
Then you go to the next stage of his life, and you're going to see Satan-inspired vision. And then, after self, Sanhedrin, Satan, all had the major part of his life, and gave him a kind of vision, destructive vision, that destroyed other people, and it was leading him to an undesirable future. The Lord Jesus Christ met him. And from that point on, he had spirit-inspired vision. If you look at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 26, Acts chapter 26, reading from verse 9, you'll see to start with self-induced vision. In Acts 26, verse 9, I, this is personal, this is just myself. I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints did I shut up in the prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. That was self-induced vision. But then he tells us that it wasn't all alone. As we look at verse 12, whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest, he said, in carrying out the vision, it went from just being a self-induced vision and the Sanhedrin, that is a council of 71 Jewish leaders in uh, the land of Israel, they backed it up and they said, this is our vision and you will be a great candidate and a great tool to carry out the Sanhedrin influenced vision. And he had that letter in his hand, and he was going to Damascus to carry out that murderous, destructive, unpreparable, undesired vision. But you know, everything actually was coming from the devil. It was coming from Satan. That's why I would say it was not just a self-induced vision, and it was not just a Sanhedrin-influenced vision, it was also Satan-inspired vision. And in this chapter 26 of Acts of the Apostles, reading verse 10 and verse 11, which thing also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. You know that the one that actually carried out that murderous plan was the devil. I punished them out in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. You know the person behind that is actually Satan. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them unto even unto strange cities. And while he was going, the Lord met him and said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is a hard thing for you, dangerous thing for you, eternally dangerous thing for you to kick against the priest. What you are doing, if you continue in this kind of vision, you are going to end up in a place you don't have any vision for now. Because if you take the wrong road, you are going to get to a wrong destination. If you follow the wrong master, you are going to spend eternity with him in a place you will not enjoy. What shall I do? What do you want me to do? At that moment in time, his life changed. His life turned around. And then he had a vision that then propelled him, compelled him, that inspired him, that influenced him, that stirred him up, that kicked him on, moved him on for the rest of his life. That's why now he says in verse 19, whereupon, O King Agrippa, he had told the story already. I was going on the way to Damascus. 
And then the Lord met him and stopped him on his journey and told him, this is not the way to spend your life. You are too precious for such a plan like this. And you are too precious for such a vision like this coming from self, coming from the Sanhedrin, coming from Satan. Come on, there is a savior from heaven and he wants to give you a vision. And when you get that vision in your, in your system and in your heart and in your sight, you're going to do something better. And the Lord gave him a vision right there. And then he told King Agrippa some years after and said, whereupon, oh King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. It is this vision we're looking at today. And I'm praying that the same way the Lord gave vision to Paul the Apostle, he will also give you vision to live your rest, the rest of your life by in Jesus' name. Paul the Apostle with many others in the Bible serve as pattern of visionary Christian leadership. I divide the message to three parts. Number one, perception of of purpose perception of purpose by visionary leaders visionary leaders they know there is a purpose for living there is a reason why we are living every moment counts with a visionary leader every day counts with a visionary leader and every project every program counts with a visionary leader every contact counts with a visionary leader. Every experience counts with a visionary leader because there is something that God has done in the life, in the heart of a visionary leader. He has perception of purpose. Life is focused. He is purpose driven because leadership actually begins when a vision emerges. So, point number one, the perception of purpose by visionary leaders. Point number two, the pattern and practice of visionary leaders. Visionary leaders are active leaders. They are moved on. There is something propelling them, compelling them, stirring them up. And they, they, they are not people that will just rest or stay or they are idle or they are indolent, or they are just passive. No, Le mission visionary leaders are not passive. They are passion. And that passion creates a pattern and a practice in their lives. Point number three, the pursuit and the perseverance of visionary leaders. And that's why I'm praying for you, that your life will count for something. This life that we see now, and it appears you have not done much. I know you have done much by the grace of God, but comparing what, what, with what you are still to do and what you are still about to do, what you have done in the past will look like nothing when you look at what you are going to do in the future. The power of God is upon you. The anointing of the Lord is upon you. The vision of the Lord is being revealed to you. You will never be the same again. Our countries, our communities, where you come from, will never be the same again because of the vision the Lord himself will impart unto you in Jesus' name. Let's pick them up one by one very quickly. Number one, perception of purpose by visionary leaders. And let's go back to this man, Moses, in Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. You know, Exodus chapter 3 is talking to you about the vision that Moses received. And it brought power, purpose, direction, focus, concentration into this man's life. Listen, 40 years passed. He thought as a young person, uh, getting to 40, God has raised me up. And I'm going to deliver the children of Israel. What a vision. That the people that had been there about 400 years, that those four centuries, they had been in the land. And they have not gone to the promised land where they ought to go. That one single man 
can deliver a whole nation out of the captivity of 400 years. Actually, they spent more than 200 years in Egypt. But when you think about the time that God had given the promise to Abraham, until the time they left the land of Egypt, all together, that's what we are calculating as actually 430 years. And when the Lord picked up Moses, he said, your life will do something. He had that vision before, but he made a mistake. And because of that mistake, he ran away. And when he ran away, he thought, it's all over. Maybe you have made some mistakes in your life. And you did something that you think, I thought God will use me. I thought I'll be significant. I thought something good will happen. But see the sin I committed. And see the mistake I made. And see the fall that came to me. My brother, God has forgiven. My brother, that thing is of the past. My brother, this is a new day. And the vision that God gave before, which you thought has been lost. The Lord is calling you again. Rise up. There is a work to do. And you will do it in Jesus' name. In Exodus chapter 3, I'm reading from verse, te, verse 1. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even unto Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burnt with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Your Bible students like myself, you understand? This is a picture of the children of Israel. They had been under the fire of persecution in Egypt. And yet, you know, this Moses, he had not got good information from home for 40 years. He's been at the backside of the desert. And now God was showing him the people are still alive. The fire of persecution from Egypt and from Pharaoh had been burning, but they were not consumed. The people you are to minister to, they are still there. I said they are still there. Yes, there's poverty, burning. Yes, there is HIV, AIDS, burning. Yes, there is economic uh, crunch or whatever, burning. Yes, we know there's corruption, burning in the various countries. But the people are still there, even though they have gone through the fire. The fire of natural disaster and the fire of drought. They have not been consumed. They are still waiting for you. And you are the man of this hour. You are the woman of this hour. And what the Lord has called you to do, like he called Moses, you will do it in Jesus' name. In verse 3, it says, Moses said, I will now turn and aside and see. When the Lord gets your attention, a ministry is about to begin. When the Lord turns you around and then you say, I want to see. What is this? What vision is this? What painting is the Lord making upon my heart? What portrait I am, am I looking at now? I will turn aside and see. When God gets your attention like that, a new ministry, a new breakthrough is about to begin in your sight. Why the bush is not burned? And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him. God will call your name. You will hear. God will call your name. God's interest is upon you. God's assignment is being given unto you. And God is saying, yes, there are millions of people. Yes, there are thousands of people. But you, you will do something significant in the kingdom of God, in the vineyard of the Lord, in Jesus' name. The moment God calls your name, something new is about to begin. The moment God leaves every other person and he comes to you in the isolated place where you are, in the dungeon where you are, or in the backside of the desert where you are, and he determines, he decides, he's going to show you a particular vision. Something is going to take place in your life in the years to come. If Jesus tarries, we'll read about your story. We'll read about your ministry. And we will see what the Lord is doing through you in Jesus' name. God called him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. You will answer when he calls you. And he said, draw not nigh hither. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet. For the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham. A covenant-keeping God. 
even though it has appeared long, but this is the time it is being fulfilled now. The God of Isaac and the God of Jacob, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows, and I am come down to deliver them. I am come down to deliver them. I am come down to deliver them. My brother, don't be afraid. Yes, he's sending you out. And the people will think, Pharaoh will think, who is this Tamara? Who is this fellow? A fugitive. Who is this fellow? A stranger. You've been away for 40 years and you have come and you say you want to deliver the children of Israel. They will think it is you. They do not know there is a greater power in you. They do not know that God himself, God Almighty, is the one that is going to do it through you. God said, I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land unto a good land and a large unto a land flowing with milk and honey unto a place unto the place of the canaanites and the hevites and the amorites and the parasites and the hivites and the jebusites now therefore behold the cry of the children of israel is come unto me and i have also seen the oppression wherewith the egyptians oppress them Come now. Don't let us waste time anymore. Lord, what do you mean? I am 80 years of age already. He didn't know that God was not going to allow him to die until this assignment had been carried out. And you don't know. God is not going to allow you to die until this new assignment the Lord has given you is carried out. Maybe you have just started, but this good thing you have started, you will finish. Nobody will take your place. The good work the Lord has started with you. And the good ministry he has sent you to go and effect. He has called you, although you might have lived two thoughts of your lifespan. That is, out 40, 40, 40. The first two 40s, they are gone already. Remaining only the last 40. Two thoughts of his lifespan had gone what he did on record for the last section one third of his life was more than what he did in the first two thirds of his life can i tell you that what you will do in the rest of your life no matter what you have done before how great things you have done before what remains for you to be done will be greater than what you ever did in your life in jesus name come now this is the day and this is the time come now and i will send thee unto pharaoh that thou mayest bring forth my people the children of israel out of egypt he did it you will do it i said you will do it in joshua chapter one here is the vision that another man had and the lord gave him this vision because he was the one to now lead the children of israel right into the land of canaan yes there are there were giants there yes there were walled cities there yes it appeared that impossibilities were there everywhere he turned impossibility looked at him stared at him right in the face but joshua went through he went through and you're going to go through in joshua chapter one now after the death of moses the servant of the lord it came to pass that the lord spake unto joshua the son of Nun, moses minister saying moses my servant is dead moses my servant is dead moses my servant is dead listen there's a lot here but we don't have time i want to keep it brief today moses my servant do you know even after moses died he was still the servant of god i said he was still the servant of god what document what word did the children of israel go by after moses died what moses had written although even after you have left if jesus tarries your work will still be on your ministry will still be on even after joshua had left and the kings and the prophets took over 
How did the kings, how did the prophets direct the children of Israel? Whenever they were to discover, we have gone out of the way. And whenever Nehemiah was praying, whenever Ezra was praying, whenever Daniel was praying, how did they discover they had gone out of the way? They referred back to what God had used Moses to write down. Even though Moses had gone, I'm saying that your ministry will outlive you. Your work will outlive you. What you do today, today is not the end. The people that the Lord himself has made you to have impact upon the effect of your ministry and the influence of your ministry. The good, good things you have said and the good, good things you have done, everything will still follow you even after you are gone in Jesus' name. Uh -uh. Look at this Moses now. We see Jesus Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration. And who do we see with the Lord Jesus Christ? Here is Elijah. Here is Moses. And they were discussing with him on his death, on his sacrifice, on the atonement. Don't you see? The ministry of Moses went on even through to the new covenant. And then you come to the revelation. And it says the people sang the song of the Lamb. And they sang the song of Moses. I'm telling you that whatever you don't minimize and don't belittle yourself. Don't say, what am I doing? Am I not just there? You are not just there. I said you are not just there. God is doing something with you. And God is doing something through you. And even after you have gone and you have left the place, maybe you have not died, but you have moved to another place, and you have moved to another place. The effect of what you have done while you were in that place, that effect will still continue, and the reward will continue as well in Jesus' name. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all these people unto the land, which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel, every place. The sole of your foot shall tread upon that have I given unto you. I said that have I given unto you. As I said unto Moses in verse 5, There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of a good courage. For unto these people thou shalt divide for inheritance the land, which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law, which Moses my servant commanded. Do you hear this? Do you hear this? I do, I'm not going to give you a new law. I'm not going to give you a new word. All that Moses my servant had done, because it's, I still recognize his ministry. Only that he's not physically here, I still recognize his ministry. Everything that Moses had written, that's my word. And although the messenger may die, the message will never die. Although the messenger may leave and quit the location, the message, the divine message coming from the Lord will never die. Because of that, you will observe to do according to all that my servant Moses commanded you. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left. That thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. You will have it. I said you will have it. Acts of the Apostles chapter 26. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 26, we're looking at it from verse 15. The vision, the perception of the purpose of visionary leaders. You see, when you have vision, that's when leadership actually begins. Leadership begins when a vision emerges. And a vision is clear. It's a clear picture of what the leader sees the ministry accomplishing or achieving from that clear picture. He then plans how he, the vision will become a reality. It tells us in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 26. Acts chapter 26, reading from verse 15. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet. For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. 
a purpose. I want you, my brother, my sister, because become a purpose-driven man, a purpose-driven woman, that there is a purpose in your life, and your eyes are set. Your direction is determined, and you say, this is the one single thing to do, and I am going to do it. Then you, he says to make thee a minister and a witness both of the things which thou hast seen and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee. Paul, have you seen something? Yes, I did. That's a vision. That's a vision. And I'll still be showing you greater, higher, better, richer, more extended visions than you have seen. But walk according to that vision. Now understand, the direction of your life is now determined by that vision. The purpose of your life is now determined by that vision. I'll be delivering you from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom I now send thee. What are you going to do what you get, when you get there? Verse 18, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that's in me. And then as Paul the Apostle looked back into the ministry that the Lord has called him to, then he said, King Agrippa, you know what? There's one thing I can tell you. Yes, sometimes I've been on the mountain. Sometimes I've been in the valley. Yes, sometimes I needed to carry out that vision and it was in the prison. Sometimes it's been in Jerusalem. Sometimes it's been in Galatia. Sometimes it's been among the Gentiles. Yes, sometimes I've had people with me and sometimes all the people of Asia Minor, they are forsaking me. Sometimes I've had people like Timothy and Titus, and sometimes about people like Alexander, uh, the coppers me that did me evil. But through it all, in the valley and on the mountain, through it all, everywhere, every time, in the night and in the day, even when my legs are stuck in the stalls, even when it appears it's in the dungeon and the darkness of the prison, through it all, Agrippa, I can tell you this one single thing. I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. How did you carry it out, Paul the Apostle? Here is how I carried out, but I should first unto them of Damascus at Jerusalem, and also throughout all the coast of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do the works meet for repentance. That's what we are saying when you have a vision. And the Lord has given you a vision, you become driven. You are driven by the very fact that this is the call of God upon your life. And because the Lord has called you and the Lord has placed a vision on you, you, you don't want to think about any other thing. When you are dreaming, you are dreaming about it. When you are planning, you are planning about it. When you are praying, you are praying about it. Whatever it is you are doing, and whoever is in your company, you are thinking about, and you are doing this one single solitary thing that the Lord has called you to. And you are saying, I cannot leave it. I cannot leave it because this is what the Lord has put upon my life. I'm calling upon you this morning that you will know why the Lord has called you. And you will know what the Lord has called you for. And then you have this purpose and you have this direction and you have this single life and you have this single purpose and this single focus. And you say, this one thing I do. Invitation will come. Can you become a politician? I'm sorry. This one thing I do. Will you do this? and do that i'm sorry those are good things and those are good projects but i have a vision i have a mandate upon my life and i want to tell you this one thing i do and the vision is the thing that drives you the vision is the thing that propels you the vision is the thing that moves you on and you don't care the wind that blows you don't care the heat that may come and you don't care the people that may come along neither do you care the people that may even desert you you say the lord has called me when he gave me the vision it was not myself and so and so myself and such and such if god has given other people vision and our visions come together because when i met timothy when i met titus and when i met aquila and priscilla and when i met all these other people when i met him um, all these uh, that I, I saw that our visions were the same and then they looked at my vision i looked at their vision and i saw that we were all the same in vision and i said we can move on together we can do it together and we can preach this gospel together and we 
we can run to all the places together because their single vision that is flowing in your blood, that is flowing in your, in your veins, and that is in your brain, and it's in your sight. And the only thing you see, and the only thing you know, and the only thing you want to get in more ways is this one single vision. That's a purpose-driven man. That's a man that knows there's only one thing to live for. And this single thing to live for, it will consume your life. It will take your time. And it will surround you. It will hedge you around that if there is any other call, if there is any other assignment, if there is any other thing you think you want to, you say, no, I cannot do that. That is not my calling. The one single thing that the Lord has called me to. Here is the thing to do. Here is the way to spend my life. Here is the way to spend all my days. King Agrippa, or whoever you are talking to, I was not disobedient. I was not rebellious to this single vision. It motivates you. It drives you. It propels you. It stirs you up. And that is a single thing to do. In Matthew chapter 28, Matthew chapter 28, reading from verse 18, Jesus came and he spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me, both in heaven and in the earth. Here the Lord Jesus Christ came to his own disciples. You know, these apostles, it, it's like they had lost the vision. It's like uh, the, the thing that drove them. And what Peter had spoken about, Lord Jesus, we have left everything and we are following after you. What shall we have therefore? It's like after Jesus died, even after Jesus Christ rose from the dead, it's like uh, the vision, they had lost the vision. That's why Peter said, I go a fishing. And all the other disciples also followed and said, we go with you as well. They lost the vision. And when Jesus visited them, if there was anything that was restored, yes, Peter had been restored, but he needed the vision to be restored. That's why Jesus came to them, come and dine. And then they dined with him. After they dined with him, he said, Peter, see where we are again. Peter, see where we are again. Now, you're fishing. Look at all the fish. What did I call you to do? And what did you respond? And what did you promise? And what vision did I give you on that day when I met you for the first time? Now you will tell me, lovest thou me more than all this? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Then come back and come into the vision again. Feed my lambs. I want to be very sure. Peter, you'll tell me, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than all these? Lovest thou me at all? Yes, you know that I love you. Feed my sheep. Come back to the vision. If your life is going to amount to anything, if your life is going to be significant, if your life is going to make a mark in the generation in which you live, it will depend on the vision you are living by. And he asked him the thought time simon son of jonas lovest thou me and simon peter he was unhappy he was grieved because jesus asked him for the third time lovest thou me? yes i must ask you yes i must ask you the first time and the second time and the third time because you have lost your vision because a person that has lost his vision he'll be roaming about a person that has lost the vision he'll be here and there a person that has lost the vision you'll go back to the net that you dropped before the thing you have said bye bye you and the sin you should have burnt and the breed you should have burnt and the things you should have abandoned when you lose your vision you will go back to them again that's what i'm asking you for the third time i have to be very sure whether right now from this point on until the rest of your life whatever happens whatever does not happen i want to be very sure that you are going to continue in this single vision and be a purpose-driven man that's what i'm asking you for the third time love us thou me you know all things and you know my heart that in spite of my mistake in spite of my lukewarmness in spite of my coming to the seaside here what could i have done i've denied you and even though you have forgiven me i thought you had blotted out the vision i thought it's not me anymore that's why i came over here and jesus said i'm getting you back to the vision and i'm getting the vision back to you again feed my sheep that's how peter came back and that's how you are coming back I said, that's how you are coming back. That this same 
vision that the Lord is calling you back to again, you are picking it up again. I said you are picking it up again. And now, no day of your life will be a useless day. No moment of your life will be a useless moment as the Lord is calling you and telling you, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you and lo and with you always, even to the end of the age. Listen to this. As long as you remain in that vision, he'll be with you. As long as you keep going, he'll be with you. As long as you do not abandon the vision, as long as you do not abandon the purpose of living and the purpose for your calling, and you remain in this vision the Lord has called you to, then he says, while you keep on teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, then lo and behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Have you perceived, have you seen the purpose for living? For your own life, I'm not talking of general purpose. I'm so talking about you in particular. That you know, here is the thing to live for. And here is the thing to do. And with your life blood, and with all the resources you have in you, and with all the ability and skill you have in you, you're going to concentrate and focus on this single vision that the Lord has called you to. Now, how are we going to know if you are such a purpose driven man? How are we going to know if you are such a visionary leader that you know you've got something and you're going to do that thing? We'll see it by the pattern of your life. We'll see it by the practice in your ministry. Point number two. The pattern and the practice of visionary leaders. The pattern and the practice of visionary leaders. I come to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3, I'm reading to you from verse 2. In Hebrews chapter 3 verse 2, it says, Who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. He was faithful to God, the God who had appointed him. Are you always looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith? Or are you looking at all the things, the wind that blows? The events that take place, the difficulties of the time, and the dangers of the time, and the politics of the country, and the economy of the country, and the destructions that come day after day. If that is what you're looking at, you'll not be able to fulfill what the Lord has called you to do. But we're told he was faithful to him that appointed him, even as also as Moses was faithful in all his house. And then he tells us in verse 5, he's saying, and Moses verily, certainly, assuredly, was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things we which were to be spoken after. You see, when the Lord calls you and He puts the vision in you and imparts the vision onto you and He makes the pop portrait and the vision to be before you in your sight. Every time you wake up in the morning, you are looking at it. You are, you are sleeping at night, you are dreaming about it. And then you write it in different places, in a place where you always meet it. The, the vision, you write it down and you read it every time. You rehearse it, you rebuke, you recite it every time. And it becomes part of you. It will move you on to faithfulness. You will want to be faithful. In fact, we are told in Hebrews chapter 11 concerning this Moses once again. In Hebrews chapter 11, reading from verse 24. In verse 24, it says, By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. How could that be? That was a great privilege that he'll be called Pharaoh's daughter's son. And yet he said, no, I have a greater vision than that. A greater vision than being the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And when you come to know, when you come to know that the Lord himself is calling you to something greater than politics, greater than being a prime minister in the land or in the country, greater than being the greatest, uh, maybe whoever or whatever, lecturer or whatever, in any institution. And you understand, here is the call of God upon your life and that you know, you've seen the vision and you're following through that vision by faith. It says, by faith, he made a choice. 
by faith he determined by faith he will not allow even privileges and opportunities and position in the land to distract its attention then we're told in verse 25 choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of god than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season I'm telling you something. Well, even when you think about it, when you think about it, the temptations that come to you as a human being, the temptations that come to you as a minister, if you have vision, if you have vision, it's like, for example, you are going somewhere. You, you want to catch the plane. And you know that this is the time the plane is leaving. And there are some little, little things wanting to tie you down. And you're looking at your time. You're looking at your time. You're looking at your time. And you know that the plane will soon leave. And where you are going is such an important place. Where you are going is the very thing in your life that will make a definite mark on your life. All these other things that might want to attract you and distract you and tempt you and make you to fall into sin. Say, no, even if I wanted to do I don't have time. Even if I wanted to do it, my mind will not be there. Even if I wanted to do it, the place I'm going and the things I want to do and the things I want to accomplish and the thing I want to achieve in my life is greater than this. The pleasures of sin will mean nothing to you because you know there's a place you're going and because there's something you want to achieve. The practice of your life, the pattern of your life will center around the vision will center around the purpose of living, will center around the calling of God upon your life, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. And then it says, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith in verse 27, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible invisible to all the other Israelites invisible to all the Egyptians invisible to the ordinary people but visible to him that's the vision he was seeing the vision and he watched the pattern of his life and the practice of his life was like he was seeing him who is in Visible. That's Moses. Let me show you the example of this other visionary leader that we read about yesterday. It's Nehemiah. In Nehemiah chapter 4. Nehemiah chapter 6 rather. In Nehemiah chapter 6, we're looking at verse 2. Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 2. That Shambhalat and Geshem sent unto me saying, Come. Let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me mischief. They wanted to distract my attention. They wanted to get me away from the vision that the Lord had given me. Friends and uh, neighbors, Shambhalat, Geshem, Tobiah, what are you thinking about? Why do you think I left the courts of Pasha? Why would you think I left all these things, all the privileges of meeting those ambassadors? And I'm now in Jerusalem, in the land of the people of God. And I came over here so that I can build the wall of protection and the wall of power and the world that signifies possession and the world that signifies prestige among the people of God. Why do you think I left all those things? And I came over here and you are telling me to come, let us meet together in some one of the villages. Then in verse 3, I sent messengers unto them. I am doing a great work. I'm a purpose-driven man. There's a vision that is burning within me. There's a fire and a fervency that will not be quenched and that will not be slowed down that is burning within me. I am doing a great work so that I cannot calm down. But I want to be your friend. No, but I don't have any friend that will not contribute to the vision of my life. But I want to hurt you. But I don't care if you're going to hurt me because if I'm hurt while I'm carrying out my vision, that is great. That is wonderful. That's the reason uh, this man, Nehima, said, I don't have any time for you because I'm doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease whilst I leave it and come down to you? And then he tells us, as you think about this in verse 4, yet they sent unto me four times again, over and over and over after they sought. And I answered them after the same manner. Are you like that? 
Is that the pattern of your life? Is that the practice of your life? When you look at Paul the Apostle, that's exactly what you see. That's exactly what you see. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 20, Acts of the Apostles chapter 20, the pattern of the life of people that are visionary leaders and the practice of the lives of people that are visionary leaders. Acts of the Apostles chapter 20, in chapter 20, I'm reading to you from verse 20, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Now behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, except save that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city, saying that the bonds, the bonds and afflictions abide me. That is, bonds, afflictions, difficulties, suffering, oppression, imprisonment are waiting for me there. But here is a man with a vision. Here is the pattern of the life of a man with a vision. Here is the understanding of a purpose-driven man. In verse 24, but none of these things move me. Difficulties, discouragement, persecution, oppression. When you have vision and you know the Lord has called you in that location, in that region, in that state, in that nation, the Lord has called you, many, many things will show up. Many ideas will come. Persecution may arrive. You will not run back home. You will not be writing letters back home. Uh, sir, can you please change my assignment? The work is difficult in this place. It appears the gospel will not get through in this place. It will get through. I said it will get through. You will be able to say like Paul the Apostle, but none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself. Your, the purpose of life is more important than the physical life. What are we living for if you don't have a vision? What are we living for if you don't have a purpose? What are we living for if you cannot carry out the assignment for which the Lord has raised you up? Health is nothing if it doesn't contribute to your fulfilling your goal in life. And life is nothing if it does not contribute to the purpose for which the Lord has raised you up. Money, riches, wealth, they are nothing if they do not contribute to the purpose for which the Lord has raised you up. Popularity and friendship and fellowship, they are nothing if they do not contribute to the purpose of your life. That is the life of a purpose-driven man. There is a pattern, there is a practice in the lives of people that are having vision, vision from the Lord, that everything that happens to you, everything that surrounds you, will be to move you on in the goal, in the dream, in the destination, and in the vision that the Lord has given you. That's why it says, but none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. So that I may finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Well, how did he practice? How did he do it? How did he achieve it? In 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I'm reading to you from verse 16. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16, for though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. It says, now I've come to the point I don't have, even have any choice. Even if I wanted to leave it, what could I do? Necessity is laid upon me. In fact, for if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. If I'm joyful in it, all right. If I'm sad in it, I have no choice. And if there is support, wonderful. If there there is no support, no problem, because it says a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. What is my reward then? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. What he meant by making his himself a servant to all is not cringing, is not compromising, is not saying, well, because of the vision, 
I have to compromise so that I can befriend people. Because of the vision, I have to compromise, I have to cringe, I have to bow, I have to be asking them every time, what do you think? Can we go and preach? What do you think? Am I allowed to go? That, that's not what he means. What he means is, I make myself a servant unto all. In what sense? He tells us in verse 20, unto the Jews, I became as a Jew. I go to the Jewish section and then I know their law. And then I preach in such a way that it will be conformable to their way of understanding. That I might gain the Jews to them that are under the law, as under the law. That I might gain them that are under the law. I develop different strategies and different methods in different in different places the message remains the same the gospel does not change and the requirement of the gospel and the standard of the gospel and the demand for holiness and righteousness without which no man shall see the Lord does not change but methods change from place to place therefore as I were the Jews yes I still tell them Jesus is a savior and without Jesus Christ you cannot come to God he is the way he is the truth he is the life but I use the scriptures with them I show them the way unto life eternal through their scriptures when I go to the Gentiles that have no scriptures then I still use all that I need to use I adapt my method I change my strategies and then I'm still able to reach out to them then he tells us in verse uh, in verse 21 to them that are without law as without law being not without law to God but under the law to Christ that I might gain them that are without the law to the weak I be became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do, for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. You see then a man here having the pattern and the practice of visionary leaders. Having a vision is not enough. There must be a commitment to translate that vision to action. I have vision. That's good. I'm visionary. That's good. I see a preferable future. I see a preferable painting portrait of the future. Wonderful. When are you going to act on that? Because it's not enough to just talk about the vision. You must have a commitment to translate the vision to action. It is one thing to be consumed by a vision for evangelization, the evangelization of your community or country. Having the picture of every person there hearing and responding to the gospel is another thing, a different thing, a greater thing, a higher thing, a preferable thing. When actually you do something and you plan and you work with purposeful program to fulfill that vision, there must be then a determination. To overcome all difficulties and to eliminate all obstacles as you pursue the realization of the God-given vision. I come to point number three. The pursuit and perseverance of visionary leaders. The pursuit and the perseverance of visionary leaders. You've seen it already in the life of Paul the Apostle, as he said, that none of those things moved him. All he wanted to was that he'll be able to finish his course with joy. The work the Lord had given him to do, he tells us in Second, Second Corinthians chapter 4. Second Corinthians chapter 4, the pursuit, as well as the perseverance that a minister of God, a visionary leader, will have in pursuing the fulfillment, the realization of his dream, of his purpose, of his vision. It tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, reading from verse 1, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, whatever else we don't have, we have this ministry, Whatever else the Lord is saying, don't bother yourself with that. Don't go that direction. You don't need this other one. The purpose of your life does not demand that you have this or that. But you have this one single thing. Know what you have and stay in the perimeter, in the territory, inside the circle of what is permitted you to do. Because this is the very purpose of your life. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry. We have we have received 
as we have received mercy, we faint not. If you're going to carry out your vision, you will not faint. You will not be discouraged. You will not be deterred. And there will be no detour. You will not, not be distracted and sidelined. Then it says, but we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And then he tells us, from verse 6, look at this from verse 6, for God who has commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, but yet not distressed. We are perplexed. But not in despair, we're persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Can you see here that? That this apostle Paul, everything he went through, he, he said, Yes, all those things do not matter. What matters is to concentrate on the vision and make sure you are still on the right path and you are moving on perseveringly and you are pursuing without ever turning back and you are walking every day without interruption and you are walking every day in the direction of reaching your final goal that you may be able to finish what the Lord has called you to do and that's what the Lord is calling you to do that you will overlook everything everything whatever you see whatever you hear you'll block your ear you'll block your mind you'll block your sight against all those things and no there is one last Life to live and you want to live that life to fulfill the vision that the Lord has given to you in verse 16 it says for which cause we faint not no we dare not faint we dare not faint on the battlefield we dare not faint while the sinners are waiting for us to evangelize and to preach the Lord unto them we dare not faint and while the devil wants to take advantage of the day and he wants to see if there is any sign of fainting any sign of discouragement and he wants to pounce on you and destroy you and destroy the ministry and destroy the mission we dare not faint for which cause we faint not but do our outward man perish yet the inward man is renewed day by day for our light affliction that's how he summarized everything that he went through all the persecution all the imprisonment he said our light affliction which is but for a moment walketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory why we look look not at things which are seen but at the things which are, but are the things which are not seen for the things which are seen are temporal but the things which are not seen are eternal and uh, you find then that this uh, Paul the apostle he was a man that actually he was facing just one direction there was nothing else to do there was nothing else to think about in the day in the night in the week in the month in all the years of his life he faced just one direction and he said this is it to do friends there is no other thing to do your life dedicated to just this one thing the vision that the Lord had given you in Hebrews chapter 12 Hebrews chapter 12 reading from verse 1 it says wherefore seen we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us looking unto jesus the author and the finisher of our faith who for one who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of god is calling upon us that now that we have heard about the vision and the lord himself is painting the picture of 
of the mission, how to spend your life, what to do, how to abandon yourself and everything you have got into the fulfillment of your ministry, that it will be in your heart, that it, whatever happens, whatever comes, whatever goes, that you're going to concentrate fully on this single thing that the Lord has given you to do. He's saying then if you're going to do it that and accomplish and achieve that, you'll be looking unto Jesus. You'll be looking unto Jesus. You'll, ha you'll hear some sound behind you. Don't look back. You'll, hear, you'll see some pictures all around. And you'll see some things trying to call you here. Why don't you come here? Why don't you do this? Why don't you uh, don't, just close your ears to them and block your view to them and say, I know where I'm going. I know what God has called me to do. And this one thing I will concentrate upon because you want to fulfill the ministry. The Lord has sent me to you today to tell you something. I'm telling you from Colossians chapter 4 verse 17. Colossians chapter 4 verse 17 is saying, and say to Archippus, put your name there. If I knew your name, even if I even if I knew your name, I couldn't have mentioned your name because of, you know, there's so many people here and I'm speaking to you. I'm speaking to you. I'm speaking to everyone. And the Lord said, sent me to you to tell you, say unto him, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it, fill it full with all your time with all your energy, with all your resources, with everything you have got, with the last ounce of energy in you, that you fulfill your ministry. Whatever noise you hear, whatever sight you see, you know there is only one thing to achieve in life, and it is to fulfill your ministry. The Lord is telling me to tell you that I shall say to you that you will concentrate on that ministry, and you will fulfill that ministry. How are you going to do that? How are you going to be able to fulfill that? You'll find that in, in Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. As you look at this, then you understand, here is how to fulfill that ministry. Open your Bible to Philippians chapter 3, and we're looking at verse 13. Here it says in verse, in verse 13, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. That's what the Lord is calling you to. That you will come to the position now in your life and you make up your mind and you take a decision. This one thing I do. I'm forgetting those things which are behind. And then I'm pressing on to the mark of the high calling in Christ. It says, I'm reaching forth to those things which are before. And I press toward the mark for the price of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Will you get to the position now in your life where it is this one thing I do? A visionary leader is a purpose driven leader. He pursues just one thing needful, he's earnest. Is uncompromising, he's fervent in spirit. And the only thing he sees. And the only thing he cares for, and the only thing he lives for, is the fulfillment of the vision. The God-given vision that the Lord has given him. You see that at the back of your program. A Christ-like minister is preeminently a man of one thing. He is earnest. He is hearty. Is uncompromising. He is thoroughgoing. He is wholehearted. He is fervent in spirit. He only sees one thing. He cares for one thing. He lives for one thing. He is swallowed up in one thing. That one thing is to please the Lord. And if you don't fulfill the ministry the Lord has called you out, are you going to please the Lord? Whether he lives or whether he dies. Whether he has health or whether he has sickness. Whether he is rich or whether he is poor. Whether he pleases man or, he, or whether he gives offense. Whether he is thought wise or whether he is thought foolish. Whether he gets blamed or whether he gets praise, whether he gets honor, or whether he gets shame. For all this, the man of vision, the visionary leader, cares nothing at all. He burns for one thing. And that one thing is to please God and to advance God's glory. 
and you'll find Paul the Apostle and the rest of the Apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were all men, they were all ministers, they were all visionary leaders. They were men of one thing. They threw themselves into one grand pursuit. And they were men of one thought. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were men of one purpose. The glory of God. And John Wesley was a man like that. That's why John Wesley has left these words behind for us. Do all the good you can. By all the means you can. In all the ways you can. In all the places you can. At all the times you can. To all the people you can. As long as ever you can. This is what the Lord is calling you. My brother, my sister here this morning. This is the man you will be. This is the woman you will be. You will be a man of one sin. You will be a woman of one sin. And this single life, your life, will be useful for the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. There's no time to rest while we're here. When we get over there to heaven, you'll have eternity to rest. You'll have millions of years and billions of years and trillions of years to rest. The short time you have here, you have to devote your time and devote your attention and devote your resources and devote your health and devote your intelligence to this one thing. The ministry the Lord has committed into your hand, that you do it without looking back and without compromise, you will do it. I said you will do it. Rise up and promise the Lord, I will. Yes, I will. Yes, I will. This one thing I do. I am going to burn with the fire of this vision within me. And I'm going to run with the energy of this vision within me. I'm going to conquer the various lands. I'm going to win sinners unto the Lord. I will look away from every other sin. I will look unto the Lord, keeping my focus and keeping my eyes on the Lord. This one thing I do every day when I'm stronger, when I'm tired, when it appears the going is rough and the going is tough, I'm going to be as tough as the situation so that I can continue in my ministry and so that every day of my life, every moment of my life, it will be this one thing I do. Talk to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. My life is going to be purposeful. My life is going to be purpose-driven. And my life is going to achieve something for the glory of God. Let the Lord know you as a purpose-driven minister. Let the Lord know you as a visionary leader that by God's grace and God's strength, by God's power, you will do, you will achieve what the Lord has called you to achieve.